The day that I learned that I was terminally ill, that there was nothing that medicine could do to ameliorate even my symptoms, uh, I decided that uh, I wanted to live as long as I could, as best I was able, and I wanted to die with the dignity with which I had lived. Just to know that I have that choice. Just to know that I don't, that death can be dignified. It doesn't have to be non-controllable. I can't control. I can be the boss of my own body. <laughs> and I feel that uh, I should have the absolute right to decide whether I want to, you know, die in pain and agony and rotting away in a hospital, or whether I should be able to gather my loved ones around me and and uh, and go out my way. That's your right. That's my right. Death with dignity, a basic human right practiced openly with care in Oregon. This is a portrait of the advocates who won the law's passage, the patients and their doctors who access it, and the compassion and choices of Oregon team that stewards it. My late husband, Frank Roberts, was a member of the state senate in Oregon and had three occasions in three different legislative sessions to introduce something that was equivalent to Oregon's current death with dignity law. By the third session that he introduced it in 1993, he was in fact um, already terminally ill. And they gave him what I would describe as a courtesy hearing because he was ill. Uh, it was a way to say, well, Frank really cares about this. We're going to do this nice thing for him. And so the first time in Oregon legislative history, maybe in history anywhere, I don't know, a hearing was held on the subject of death with dignity. Though that bill never made it to the floor, a group of passionate activists soon began an epic struggle for the Death with Dignity Act that would play out in ballot boxes in Oregon and ultimately in the U.S. Supreme Court. You know, the 1994 campaign was um, kind of idyllic in a way. It was like a small band of brave campaigners. Um, there were three chief petitioners. Uh, Elvin Sennard, who really was the motivating, the prime mover behind the entire thing, and he kind of did this in memory of his wife, Sarah Sennard. So Elvin Sennard and Dr. Peter Goodwin and I were the three chief uh, petitioners. Particularly Elvin and I went a lot of places together and he would tell his story and I would always cry and then I would uh, describe the bill and describe why the bill was an antidote and was a way to prevent what happened to Elvin and Sarah um, from happening to other people in Oregon. I'm a criminal. My 25-year-old daughter, Jody was in horrible pain, dying of bone cancer. She wanted to end her life. I got her the pills. We both broke the law. The campaign was direct and honest, sharing true stories of agonizing deaths with voters. On election night, we gathered in a little gallery uh, downtown. This is a very low-budget campaign, so we didn't have a big party, but they, we, all of us, all of the people who had worked on the campaign, and there were many, uh, many, many volunteers. And uh, I would say that our chief emotional response when they called the election for us was, Surprise! <laughs> what? <laughs> we won? <laughs> um, we were really surprised. We were surprised and delighted. But election night elation would soon turn to frustration as a legal maneuver threw up a roadblock to implementation. The first challenge was brought by the Right to Life organization, which was one of our primary opponents. And they went down to Eugene in Oregon um, and they expected, I believe, that they would get a favorable ruling from this district court judge, Judge Michael Hogan. And indeed, they were not disappointed. He ruled first with a temporary injunction and then with a, putting on a permanent injunction. As the case made its way through the courts, a political move nearly unprecedented in Oregon's history was in the making. 
In 1997, Oregon's legislature called a special election to repeal the Death with Dignity Act. Such a brazen attempt to reverse the will of the people had not occurred in the state since 1908. The opposition realized how very weak their case was, and they started to get a little panicky that uh, they were going to lose this case, and um, the Death of the Dignity Act was going to be available to Oregonians. And so they prevailed on the Oregon legislature in its 1997 session to do something. Um, John Kitzhaber was the governor, and because he had said to the legislature, if you outright repeal this law, I will veto your bill uh, repealing it, um, they decided on the strategy of putting, it, putting a repeal on the ballot. Uh, the governor can't veto um, a, a ballot initiative. Placement. Judge Hogan's controversial ruling was reversed just five days before the election, and when asked to vote their conscience a second time, Oregonians overwhelmingly reaffirmed the Death with Dignity Act. With legal and political challenges overcome, Compassion client Helen became the first person to legally hasten her death peacefully, surrounded by family. But I believe the law of the United States of America, re which requires that drugs not be used for, except for legitimate uh, health purposes, that those laws need to be enforced, and, and that's my responsibility. Attorney General John Ashcroft's directive threatened to prosecute doctors who prescribed medications for the purpose of aid in dying, effectively forcing the Death with Dignity Act off the books. Oregonians responded with outrage. I still want the right to make that decision. And I'll fight till I'm dead to make that decision. And the feds just ought to leave us alone. The state of Oregon filed suit to stop Ashcroft's attempt to eviscerate the Death with Dignity Act. The challenge would become the U.S. Supreme Court case of Gonzalez versus Oregon. Compassion and choices of Oregon's clients and legal team converged on Washington to save Oregon's law. This case is about an unprecedented intrusion of federal power into that domain, and in fact by a single unelected federal official. There are many effects from the continuous chemo, such as no hair with cancer. I know when all of my treatment options have been exhausted. Having the choice gives me comfort. It's just knowing that there's an option, knowing that there's a choice. Of the 16 patient plaintiffs in the case, only four survived to see the high court strike down the Department of Justice directive in a historic 6-3 ruling issued on January 17, 2006. It brings dignity back to my life and my death. I feel so liberated today. I'm going to go out and catch a Chinook salmon on the Columbia River tomorrow. <laughs> it's very hard to take a law as sensitive as Oregon's Death with Dignity Law, as sensitive as that law is, as important as it is, as personal as it is, and constantly be fighting on, on all kinds of fronts. And when that decision was made by the Supreme Court, I think we all took a deep breath and knew that Oregon could continue to do the work it had done without federal or court interference any longer. Compassion exists to be a partner with physicians, with hospice personnel, with family members of the dying, and finally, with the person who is dying. We want to partner with them in making sure that they have full access to the law and to all other options that are avail available to them at the end of life. The option to get better pain management, to receive the best hospice care. We encourage people to be enrolled in hospice on a regular basis. And if they choose to access Oregon's Death with Dignity Law, we will be there for them. My relationship with the families is really a uh, combination of sympathy, concern, and pragmatism. They are the ones who guide the way. I always tell my client that he or she is the boss, 
and whatever path they choose, I will follow it. Caring physicians partner with clients and volunteers, ensuring that the stringent medical safeguards are followed. I think to help patients have some measure of, oh, final victory um, must be personally important to me to some way, um, if you will, snatch some level of accomplishment or victory in the face of such terrible illness. Um, I think it comes very much from listening to patients. I um, went into medicine to listen to what patients had to say and to treat people in a way that worked for them. And while it's not every patient, the patients who feel strongly about this feel very strongly about making end-of-life choices. And it's a great privilege to be able to honor those end-of-life choices and to help in this final way. It is so important that we speak to physicians, hospice personnel, nurses associations, social workers, and in addition, we get out into the community to Kiwanis, Lions, the various civic organizations that uh, uh, need to be educated because the public needs to know that this law is available. Ultimately, Compassion and Choices of Oregon is about the clients, the terminally ill patients seeking a peaceful death. We all want to live forever. None of us wants to die. And if I can maintain dignity in my life until my death, I will do so. Until the event actually occurs, I, I don't know whether I'll do it. No, nobody can know for sure. We all still want to live as long as we can. Well, that's paramount. But, but if certain circumstances obtain, I'll open the cabinet, gather people around, put on some good music and maybe a glass of wine and endure. And the one thread that runs through all of them is love of family. That profile is so prevalent, whether they be Republican, Democrat, Independent, religious, non-religious, it's the love of family. Our clients' loved ones are an integral part of our work. We seek to support their needs before and after a death. My mom um, smoked three packs of cigarettes a day. And so there was always this concern or fear about lung cancer. And um, my father was a cardiologist and used to have her uh, have annual chest x-rays because he had the same concern. And one of the chest x-rays he saw, he thought he saw something on one of her lungs and so uh, had her do a more specialized procedure, CT scan, and found that, that he was wrong, but that on the other lung there was a cancer growing. And so we caught that very early and she had surgery and part of her lung removed. Peggy Sutherland was cancer free for more than five years, but a test in 1999 showed the cancer had returned. She, she told us about it in, after Christmas and then had surgery in the middle of January of 2000, mm -hmm. her first surgery. They, it was malignant from those tests. And so then there was, I remember this concern and worry whether we should go back in and take the whole lung right then. and what we should do and whether or not it had spread. And so it was sort of this up and down. And that was sort of the way it was until it was clear that it was spread and there was no uh, going back. Our mom approached her death so straightforwardly from the minute that she knew she was terminal. And her um, asking us to help her use Oregon's death with dignity law was utterly consistent with the way she had approached her disease and, and dying and most of her living life yeah, all along. What we needed was following the rule of the law at a time when we were all pretty emotionally distraught and um, it would have been very challenging for us to try to navigate the requirements of the law on our own. And the beauty of what compassion did for us is that we didn't have to. Yeah, it, and we it, just concentrated on taking care mom. of mm -hmm. mom and being with her every day. The morning she died, all five of her kids and all of our spouses and her remaining living sister and her internist mm -hmm. and uh, one of my cousins were all in her bedroom while the compassion volunteers were downstairs preparing the medication. We were able to be with her and touch her and hold her and tell her that we loved her. Um, listened to some music and read some poetry that she was interested in and, mm -hmm. and that, that also is my mother's final memory is just having her family 100% mm -hmm. present mm -hmm. with her.
Julie speaks out to the media and lawmakers in support of aid and dying laws and as a compassion and choices of Oregon board member. Her work is a powerful tribute to her mother's journey. Because of the peace that we were all given when she died, I want others to have that same opportunity. And, and we've all heard so many stories of really awful, painful, tragic deaths. And anything I can do to help other people have the positive and loving memories that I do of my mother's death, anything I can do to help them, I'm happily doing. I continue to work with Compassion and Choices as I had from, have from the very beginning because I believe in the work, I believe in the law, and I believe in the right that people have to die with dignity. And I believe strongly that what we can talk about, we can make better. And I don't think anything is much more clear about this law than that happening in Oregon. More people are in hospice in this state than almost any state in the nation. Our pain control management is better than almost every state in the nation, maybe any state. More people die at home than die in hospitals in Oregon. Everything about the process has made dying better in Oregon for all kinds of citizens, whether they use the law and take advantage of it or whether they don't. And so it has given them dignity. It has given them choices. It has given them a sense of self-control. And Oregon has proven what happens when you make the law and the compassion come together. Thank you.